So growing up in the 90s, one of my absolute favorite game genres was mm -hmm. point-click adventure games. Wow. I mean, games like Broken Sword, Grim Fandango, even Day of the Tentacle, absolute classics. And these were the games that defined storytelling and puzzle solving for me back then. But one that really stuck with me, one that left an everlasting impression on me was the Monkey Island series, which came out in October of 1990. And let's be honest, you probably never really noticed something as simple as a flickering fire on a lookout post like this one here. But behind the scenes, the developers had a dilemma. Should they animate the flames or leave them as a static part of the background? What was the story behind that? Mark Ferrari, an artist at Lucasfilm Games back then, actually talked about this. He said, Just the extra frames to animate that little bonfire were a serious calculation in terms of consumption of disk space. Now, this might sound like a tiny insignificant thing today, but back then, every single kilobyte of disk space mattered. Like Monkey Island was shipped on floppy disks, where adding even a few extra frames of animation was a luxury. So how do we solve the issue? Well, Ron Gilbert and his uh, team at Lucasfilm Games, which was later known as LucasArts, came up with a genius workaround, which was called color cycling. So the idea was that instead of storing separate frames for animation, they just shifted the colors of the pixels in a loop. The result, the illusion of movement, but without eating up more data. A problem was solved, so not through brute force, but through ingenuity. If we fast forward to today, and the challenge of optimizing real-time visuals hasn't gone away, we may no longer be constrained by floppy disks, but we are definitely constrained by one important thing, which is performance. And what's one of the biggest challenges when it comes to real-time realistic rendering? Global illumination. That's the mix of direct lighting, the stuff coming straight from the light source, and indirect lighting, which is when light bounces off surfaces and spreads throughout the scene, making things look realistic. And that brings us to Lumen, Unreal Engine's real-time global illumination and reflection system. It was first shown off at the SIGGRAPH 2021 conference, and let me tell you, it was a big deal. But calling it just a lighting system would be an oversimplification. Lumen is so much more than that. It's an hybrid approach that combines rasterization-based techniques, real-time ray tracing methods, including ray marching, while also leveraging radiance caching and screen space techniques, including denoising. By blending these techniques, Lumen achieves real-time, fully dynamic lighting, and once we only had pre-baked light maps or light probes for moving geometry. So how does it work? In one of Epic Games' Lumen in the Land of Nanite demo presentations, Daniel Wright showcased how real-time global illumination responds dynamically. At one point, he moved a large rock over an opening, and instead of the scene instantly becoming darker, the light gradually faded away. Same thing for illuminating a scene. Light didn't just snap on, it spread naturally. Honestly, my first thoughts, it's gotta be a bug. Maybe some weird lag. But no, this was real-time global illumination working exactly as intended, solving a major challenge in the best way possible at the time. Uh, to figure out why this was happening and how Lumen actually pulls this off, I went all in on researching it. First, I watched a Lumen inside Unreal, an in-depth breakthrough of all the key features. But honestly, I still wasn't getting the core principles behind it. Then I found Paolo Sousa's talk. It was shorter, super well-structured, and had a logical flow. It made a lot more sense, but something was still missing. I felt like I understood what Lumen was doing, but I still didn't grasp the foundation behind it. So finally, I watched Daniel Wright's SIGGRAPH lecture. It was packed with deep technical analysis and solid theory, but even after all that, I felt even more lost, like I did not speak the language and I was missing the full picture. Now, I'd like to think that I'm a pretty smart guy, but after all of this, I still couldn't fully wrap my head around why Lumen worked the way it did. I had all the puzzle pieces, but I couldn't quite connect them in a complete picture. So I did what anyone would do. I checked the comment section. People were going nuts over Lumen. Some were saying it was bigger deal than Nanite. Meanwhile, everyone like developers, gamers, graphics enthusiasts, all were hyped. And I was sitting there like an odd person out. I didn't understand a single word of this. I'm still working on my Lambert shading algorithm. And the funny thing was, I wasn't even working on a Lambert shading model myself. So that's when it hit me. 
I needed to go back to the basics if I really wanted to understand how Lumen worked from the ground up. So what did I do? I went all in, but not just on Lumen. I took a deep dive into 50 years of computer graphics development, tracing back every major idea and breakthrough that led to Lumen's core technologies. Because to really get where we are now, you have to understand how we got there. So if you've ever felt like me, struggling to wrap your head around real-time lighting and computer graphics, then I invite you to join me on this journey. A journey that started with the secret of Monkey Island and led all the way to the Lumen in the Land of Nanite. Because by understanding how we got here, we might just get a glimpse of what comes next. So let's jump in. I'd like to welcome you to this lecture series on chasing the holy grail of computer graphics, real-time global illumination. This series is broken down into six key topics, each one playing a huge role in how Lumen handles dynamic global illumination and reflection today. The first are rasterization-based techniques with basic lighting approaches that have been around since the late 1960s with the most recent addition of the PBR material model. Next, we have a fundamentally different approach in ray tracing that has gained prominence at the end of the 1970s, leading to the development of path tracing as a solution to achieving global illumination. We will then go into a deep dive as to how we can make this extremely performance costly approach optimized for real-time rendering using light probes, caching, and RTX rendering. Now, since these ray tracing approaches can require specialized hardware, we will explore ray marching as a software rasterizer technique that has brought us to mesh distance fields. And finally, we will take another fundamental shift towards screen space techniques with one generating information from the G buffer and the other using advanced filtering algorithms to fill in the missing detail with sample data that is scarce. The main contributions from all these areas are present inside Lumen, which is what makes it a hybrid approach in the first place. Now, the preparation for this entire lecture series took well over three months, which is why I've been missing for so long and it's still ongoing. So if you would like to show your support, engaging with the video helps tremendously. Like if you find value here, hit that like button to show your support. And if you have thoughts, questions, or insights, drop a comment below. This is a huge topic and I'd like to hear your take on it. So we will start our journey with the essential topic of rasterization and basic lighting, which has been the foundation of real-time rendering for decades due to its fast and efficient approach to generating a 2D image from a 3D scene. But how does it actually work? And why do we still use rasterization with all other advanced approaches such as ray tracing and radiance caching, which are found in modern engines like Unreal Engine 5? Check out in the next video. Bye.